Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. So um, we engage the topic of first encounters from two directions, uh, a journalist German uh, coming to uh, Jerusalem and um, Israeli fundraisers uh, coming to, to Germany with all the complexity of uh, this situation. Um, at the beginning, I said that I'm not going to be an active chair, but uh, listening uh, to you talk, uh, uh, Nicolas, I uh, was struck by what you may agree or not, uh, are the religious origins of um, this uh, en encounter. I spoke um, uh, earlier about the issue of motivation and uh, what I uh, heard in your talk uh, is uh, a lot about um, um, the experience of shame and uh, suffering, um, like well, religious vocabulary um, actually <coughs> emerging here. And um, I couldn't, um, so you mentioned Moses Benson, I could actually, uh, um, actually uh, ignore the earlier meeting, if you're talking about here, about continuity, that happened in 1769, uh, 1959, uh, when Lafferter came to the home of the philosopher from Berlin, Moses Mendelssohn, he asked his blessing for uh, what he uh, believed is a very rationalist and maybe humanistic and, and, and modern presentation of Christian Christianity, and then he was so disappointed that he didn't get uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this blessing. Um, okay, that's what he remarked, and maybe you would like to comment uh, uh, later. But now I would like to open the floor for questions to both speakers, uh, please. So thank you both of you for a very interesting micro studies and I find it really very, very interesting and I might raise two very short questions, one to everyone. So uh, Nicolas, you, you are very known for your close reading and you offer the close reading and uh, just, no, no, it's not out of curiosity. The first sentence was an Arab house. So. I would be, uh, and you ignored it. I'm sure that you read it. <laughs> so uh, I am very curious about your interpretation because I have my own one, but I, I wouldn't like to, I would like to hear your one, your interpretation. And uh, Sh Sh Sharon, maybe only to, to comment, it's not a question that uh, uh, the idea that the rector ended up by saying that he is uh, practicing uh, civil, what is it? Civilian disobedience. disobedience. <laughs> it's very. I mean, it's a, it's 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 funny, and people were in, in a way not not laughing, but were. I mean, we were amused in a way. Uh, it's not, but uh, of course, it's not only amusing. And and uh, if you can add something to the structures, I mean, how how, how does it function in a system when a rector is actually taking steps, uh, which are against everything? It seems to be against everything, so it's hard to imagine. I guess that there is a kind of a coalition. I cannot imagine uh, Rottenstreich doing it by his own. So, if you can add something, <coughs> I'd like to answer. Can you use this? Yeah. Ah, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for both questions. Um, uh, the 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 first sentence, indeed stroke me as well and I did not com comment to that but I am thankful that you give a chance to to do so now um, all, the the whole um, introduction um, of the book I mentioned the original book the original introduction from 1961 and and the little uh, newspaper article from from directly after his return from Jerusalem is 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 full of those little signs and and uh, questionable um, uh, notions and 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 terms, and of course I I, I read it um, 
as a, as a, a sort of a passive uh, aggressiveness uh, to to uh, al although there is m many many uh, si um, uh, signs of um, of of uh, uh, wertschätzung and all that and and the big gesture of bringing him home into the german context uh, marking that he is on the wrong is in on the on the wrong place in the wrong house in in even even uh, guilty in a way as well so this parallelization process was so de demanding in them in koch and many others and i i today uh, uh, concentrate on on the koch text but i quoted some of the uh, of the perhaps most notably uh, 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 sentences from from the publication from the book when uh, when his uh, generation uh, um, co-writers uh, really turned upside down the whole situation when they uh, pressed a sort of condition into the into the um, di uh, into the dialogue which didn't even start in that time and the conditions are clear there are there are values german values that are indestroyable and they are still there we we, we can still use them brackets although they were used before for really exercising the jews out of it so the, the literature history um, all those uh, scholarly fields were really poisoned after 45 and I remember for example a great scene uh, w uh, which I read in uh, in the little newspaper collection from Moritz Goldstein in the New York library when he said uh, when he worked there and he wanted something to look up in the encyclopedia and he the only edition he found in the reading room was the, the 1937 edition and uh, which entries on Judaism Jews and uh, uh, which were pure Nazism pure this was really brown text parts pure and then he said kindly to the librarian would you mind to remove those books now after all in the 50s as well so this is new york but i would have just wanted to show that even the encyclopedias the lexicas were full of it and people can change we 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 agree on that but uh, there there it it will take a long time to change uh, the brockhaus and the myers Um, and just just to um, say yes, there is a religious uh, a, a religious tone in, in in all of that. It's guilt, it's shame, it's it's a, a, a hope for blessing. And even the quotation in in your uh, uh, fascinating paper was, please don't push us push uh, push us uh, away. So they. they in a way, it really came uh, sometimes on, on on their knees, but uh, in, on the same time, yes, of course, this is what what they have to do. But in a way, it's 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 a uh, in in the case study I presented, the, I try to figure out the uh, out the aggressive part of it, the aggressiveness underlying the let's say I I, I termed it understandable or good good reasons or in a in a in a f uh, f friendly manner and so on but under that there were um, there were um, a, a discourse which slipped into language and sometimes you can find it yes um, um, I think that the intellectuals I, sorry, I think that the intellectuals and and Nathan Reuterstreich among them, they served as kind of non parliamentary opposition. Okay, so they sorry. 
so I think now it's okay. I think that the the intellectuals in the, at the Hebrew University and among them Nathan Rotenstreich, they served as non-parliamentary opposition. The the at the late 40s and the, during the 50s, they were very close to to the charismatic figure of Ben Gurion and the the, the build of nation that he wanted, and. All of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but but langsam it's changed. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's changed, and it and the the, the fact that the the, um, the nation was more important than the society for Ben Gurion, and that the military was more important than anything than anything else, it caused that they that there was a separation, there was a gap between the two. And when he said that this is civil obedience, so he, he wanted to, and of course all the political, okay, that he was part of the Labour Party and, and, the, after, after, and the, the shift that he made afterwards. And I think that it's, it's an opposition, and that's why he used this kind of, 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 of term. Okay, we have uh, quite a long list of uh, people who would like to to ask uh, and make remarks, so let's uh, make it as brief as possible. Uh, Gabi, you're the first. Uh. All right, so I'll start out. I have several points to make. <laughs> first of all, I'm always struck by this rhetoric of forgiveness, and you know, that, that Nicolas Berg came up with, because if you think about it, look at it from the German point of view, that they were putatively Christian until the Nazis came in, the Nazis certainly did not employ the rhetoric of forgiveness. And then when Nazism collapses, they fall back into the inherited Christian discourse of forgiveness. But that discourse of forgiveness, of course, has to do with their traditional trope of you know, forgiveness and shame and all the rest, and very little to do with this intercession of 12 years. And so in a way, the forgiveness is a funny kind of thing, because what are you, you're asking forgiveness for something that was not part of this uh, tradition. Now, um, I want to say something about the Arab house, because I was in Israel in 1960, 61, and I just checked it with Chedva, and of course, they all lived in Arab houses, all the professors of the university, whether it was Rotenstreich or Ariely or anybody else, and the reason was that whether through choice or compulsion, these people left their homes, and all of a sudden, there was a housing crisis, and so they put the, uni the university professors in the Arab houses. All of Balfour Street, all of Marcus Street, all of Chovetzi on where Buber left, all these streets are, of course, the houses of the Arab middle class of Talbiyeh in the 1940s. This is the area in which we're in. And I think that it should be pointed out that that's really the case. Now, the expression Arab house at that point, and I remember this quite well, was Zelfverständnis. Nobody even noticed it. And the reason was that next to it, in the middle of it, there were vacant lots and people would put up shikunim, or houses that were like standard apartments. So you either lived in an Arab house or you lived in a big apartment block which sort of looked like uh, Le Corbusier in a cheap variety or whatever it was. <laughs> And so, and so, you know, and these were cheek by jowl. Just walk down the street and see if you can identify which houses were built in the 30s and 40s and which houses were built in the 50s and 60s. Once you've seen it, you can't miss. You don't have to be any kind of ar architectural hi historian. Now, I, I, I can't read what I wanted to say something. So, uh, there's some very important point I wanted to make, but I'll get back to it later. So, okay. Uh, Let's collect a few remarks and questions, okay. then we'll, yeah, we'll answer them. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I have a question to Nicholas Berg. At the end, you asked the question whether this was a, as you said, I believe, scientific, an element of scientific cooperation, wissenschaftliche Zusammenarbeit. And you gave a, a, a nuanced answer in some respects, yes, in some respects, no. I would stress very much more that it really was not a scientific situation. It was a journalist who interviewed the philosopher, 
and try to make a good story out of it. A moving story, certainly, addressing basic questions of an ethical uh, uh, nature, that shame, blessing. Scholarly work, scientific work, wissenschaftliche Arbeit, to use the German word, is, I think, usually less ambitious. It is more modest. It has methods. It has empirical uh, relations. It follows certain rules in which such big problems like debt, uh, like, uh, excuse me, Schuld, like guilt and uh, uh, shame and blessing uh, appear only indirectly. And maybe it's a strength of scholarly discourse that it attacks these big qu questions only indirectly, but perhaps rather effectively. So I would draw much more a line between what we discuss here, humanities in the sense of Wissenschaften on the one hand, and the interview which you reproduced. My question uh, to Sharon Livni, very interesting paper. Uh, you stressed very much, and I found it completely convincing, the difference between the attitudes of the Weizmann Institute on the one hand and Hebrew University on the other as far as the readiness of cooperation with Germans is con was concerned. You alluded to the fact that it may be largely due to the fact that uh, uh, Weizmann Institute, natural sciences, exact sciences, un uh, university, different uh, disciplines. I wa I, that makes sense to me. But in this case, was there anything like a difference to be observed within Hebrew universities between those who, are favor uh, who worked in the natural sciences and those in the humanities? And I mean, one could argue there is a, could be another a cause, another explanation for this difference. After all, a research institution is much less a social institution, a comprehensive social uh, institution, but a university is, and this could then be a reason to be more in distance in the university case than in the research institution side. Okay, um, Raphael, uh, you have the microphone. Yes, uh, thank you both of you for uh, those uh, uh, powerful papers. Um, in a way, I think they both help us in, in terms of our project that we always keep in mind, at least the organizers, I'm sure, and those who work on it, that uh, at one point can be very helpful to try to separate the German uh, perspective and the Israeli perspective to this German-Israeli uh, uh, relations. And I think that was very helpful because both papers, in a way, were very strong at this, showing how oh, one can look at it uh, really from one perspective. Now, in terms of uh, Sharon's paper, it, I thought what I found very, I in a way think it can be really maybe be used as a tool uh, to look at more such situations. I mean, I have been in, in, in a, in a you know, on a very small scale in, in a situation where three millions were offered to the Jewish Museum, and the question is, uh, who says no to it? It's not easy. <laughs> you know, if you're offered money and you say no, then you, you're looking for allies. So I would repeat also Ifat's question, uh, you know, how is the no organized? Uh, it's it's maybe not just a moral no, but, but an individual, but someone who, you know, as you say, it's kind of, uh, you, you call, you spoke of opposition, so it's an organized no, it's not mm -hmm. just his own voice. And then the question is, you know, how strong is the no? And when does it, uh, you know, when does it fade away? When, you know, what, what is exactly the position when it's no longer strong enough to know? Uh, and, and then it's also the question of the situation. You know, what year does it, uh, is it challenged? That were all questions that would be terribly interested. I'm sure you don't have yet all the answers, but I think uh, your case study helps us tremendously to look into this. You know, where is the moral or the theological uh, aspect stronger, and where is the kind of realpolitik uh, kind of overpowering, and when does it switch?
Right. I would like uh, uh, to make a remark about, uh, to refer to Sharon's presentation, which I think is a very good summary of what actually happened. But I, my remark uh, will be based on an answer to Ifat's question. So Ifat, about this dissidence of the rector. Now, it didn't take much civil courage to be in that sense dissident. Everything worked in his favor in those days, both internally and also externally. There is one element, additional element, which Sharon uh, did not mention uh, when discussing the difference between the Hebrew University and the Weizmann Institute. Uh, the Hebrew University is in Jerusalem, very close to the Knesset, and very much in the public political eye. Everything that happened at the Hebrew University was immediately had a political reaction in the Knesset. When the two members of the uh, Otto Hahn delegation that came to the Weizmann Institute, two of them came and gave a lecture at the Hebrew University. There was an uproar at the Knesset. The Hebrew University had to respond and to re explain and to apologize why they invited them. When two students came and spent some time at the dormitories, the parliament demanded that the Hebrew University expels them. When the Hebrew University said that first representative to, uh, to Germany that I mentioned to set up uh, relations, immediately there was a reaction from the Knesset and from the mission in Cologne. Why do we do it without, without permission? Within the university, there were still, it was, you see, it's a very convoluted story very non-unified, non-homogeneous, uh, changing between people, between uh, uh, from week to week it could be a different, it could be a different reaction. I remember a, a, a demonstration in front of the office of the president of the Hebrew University of professors who heard that we are now uh, establishing not only friends organization but real we signs wait and at least wait until after our death so such things happened at the university on the other hand there was this and you ask somebody asked if if there were others there was professor david amiran who was uh, a vice who was also a vice president and he was funded from Germany in the late 50s, establishing an institute for geography at the Hebrew University. And that's, for mm -hmm. some reason, past, completely unnoticed, accepted. So that is, uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, and, and Rothschild was a politician, and he, he knew what he was doing. All right. <laughs> so there's much more to th in this story. And he changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to take the opportunity um, uh, to kind of answer the point that Jürgen Koka just made uh, regarding your point. And I actually would go in the opposite direction in, in a certain sense. Uh, I think it's on the one hand, you are absolutely right that uh, 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 there must be a a uh, clear difference between the scientific and the, uh, let's say, public or journalistic discourse. But on the other hand, I think you can learn something very important from your example for uh, understanding the scientific discourse. And this, I think, is not so much uh, not only r the religionist sub-discourse, but also the very strong um, emotional side of this whole uh, uh, thing we are discussing at the moment. I think there's morality in this uh, cooperation or starting up the cooperation, but there's a lot of emotions and affect. Uh, it's very affect geladen. And I want to, to give one example that actually should be worth of one uh, larger paper here. And I think uh, Dan Dino referred to it with the term of Sprachkultur, um, the attitude toward the, the German language on the one side and the Hebrew on the other side. And I think uh, uh, it would be very interesting to, to see uh, those two languages uh, in as uh, in the course of this uh, starting or building up of the cooperation from that point of view it's extremely emotionally problematic to to speak german for 
for Israeli scientists on the one hand, and it's it's a, a big passion to learn the Hebrew for for the for German young scholars after the war. So I think um, there is a lot of emotion inside this whole uh, problem we are discussing, or this whole phenomenon. It's not a problem. It's uh, and uh, your example points out uh, precisely the emotional part of it, and I think that we can learn. Okay, one more question. Can you? Bring the mic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can follow up on this. I wanted, also wanted to make a comment to Nicolas Berg's paper that is somehow between what you said, Nicolas Berg, and what you said, Jürgen Kocker, because I don't think that, you know, as a, as a historian, for instance, who comes to uh, Israel, let's say in the 1960s or 50s or 60s or 70s, you cannot separate your being historian from your being a German of a specific generation. And so, I mean, I love this text by Thilo Koch because it is such a clear um, setting of a scene uh, that, um, that helps him, or, or where he tries to help himself out of a shame that he actually doesn't feel guilty of. Um, but at the same time, that's one, one point that I want to make um, in regard to you or a question is, um, I didn't understand your last sentence, actually. It seemed somehow suggestive but vague. And my question is if we, I mean, I do know a lot of uh, much more recent examples where something like with Thilo Koch happened. It happened to me, it happened to colleagues, it happened in the US with Germans and, and uh, American Jews meeting. I think it's re there's really a current that goes over generations. And yet, as a historian, I'm not satisfied with the dehistoricization of this. And that's my question. How do we historicize this? Is this like a condition that we all have to live with, you know, from generation to generation? Does it make a difference if somebody is born in 1920, like Thilo Koch obviously is? Or if somebody is born in 1950, or is born in 1970? I'm not saying that it fades away, but I think it may be of a different kind. And I think that's, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to, or if you can't, but I think it's something that we have to consider. Okay, I think that uh, we let them uh, answer these uh, tough uh, questions and challenges. Uh, you would like to be the first? Uh, Perhaps I, I, I take it and um, just, to, just to repeat, if I hope if this was uh, um, I, um, I did not mention it explicitly, but implicitly you <laughs> should have um, uh, seen that I try to give um, a sort of um, uh, um, own right to the enterprise Koch uh, started. And I did not mention that there was a very good idea of him, and so I tried uh, to uh, focus on the problematic side of the of the uh, of, of the book and 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 his uh, terminology, but on the other hand, he invited uh, Max Horkheimer to contribute as the commentator of the overall collection of essays, and the critique of Horkheimer in this last essay in the book, which he took in uh, and printed. Is is striking. Yeah, it's it's very sharp and clear and and um, let's say he he it, it's aiming at the foundations of the collection itself, as it as it was stated by the editor. But he put this into it, which makes the whole collection more than interesting. It's really a source which is uh, which is. Uh, worth to, to study and to reread. So I agree with you that this text is important and it shows something. The other thing I want to use your, um, your comment to add this as well. Um, yes, it was a, a very German enterprise, but as on the same time, in the same time, uh, it, he asked every, every author to comment his own paper openly. In the, at the end of the essay, there is a, a, a little mini essay, a, a second one. 
And if you read them, if you read them, you, you can learn a, a lot uh, about the 1950s. And this makes me, uh, brings me to the point of, of Jürgen Kocker. Yes, of course, this was the journalist making a TV session uh, and an interview. But I think bringing back his experience and, 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 and really dare to uh, do in the way he did uh, to, to, to transfer this uh, into a, a, a book, into a, a book concept, brings it back to, to, to uh, literary and, and, and historical studies. The, the, not the TV session, but let's say the, the, the book is part of, uh, of the scientific discourse, of the way we are talking to each other on, on Mendelssohn and Marx and, and, uh, uh, and Heine and, and, um, and the Berlin Jewish liter literary critique of, of Kerr and, and, and uh, Tucholsky. So um, this, is a, this makes it, let's say, um, ambiguous and uh, I just started to, to try to figure out the, the shapes of this discourse and my way of, of getting a, an approach to it was it is in the middle between diplomacy and personal encounter and I tried to be fair to, to Koch as well, although I, I focused on, on, the, on the very weak points we can clearly see from today's perspective. Thank you. Sharon? Yes, um, um, just to, to say something about the differences between the humanities and the exact science. The humanities and the exact science. Um, I think it may be too easy to say that the, the humanities, the differences between the between the humanities and the exact sciences, because of the of the fields, because also and Ute, you will probably uh, you can help me with that because also in the Weizmann Institute there was. <laughs> Tomorrow, okay. <laughs> also, in the Weizmann Institute, there were a person that rejected the, 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 this process, like uh, Shalhevet Fire. He was, he was against that, and he, and uh, and Amos de Shalit and Joseph Kohn was was in favor of of this. Helpful, okay. But he, with the, with this um, with this conversation with the Lorenz Krüger, he had disagreements with him. Okay. But um, so, but also in the investment institute, they knocked in, in each door and asked if they can, uh, if they can make this uh, this cooperation even closer. Okay, so they also asked in the investment institute, and I don't know. I, I I'm trying to look for the answer. So why why in the humanities it was only in the 70s, only in the middle, at, the, at the beginning of the 70s in Tel Aviv universities, but then in the Hebrew university, the middle of the 70s. So I try to look maybe in the political, in, in the, sorry? It has to do with the fact that the people of the humanities, like Huber and Scholem, mm -hmm. were people who thought and wrote and in German. Therefore, they had a far more intimate relationship to German culture than the people in the sciences. And therefore, the reaction was the greater. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think it, it, it was a wonderful uh, session and important uh, discussion. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Sharon, for the really amazing uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you.